the microphone is not. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I think you broke my brother. What yeah. did you clone, what did you do to him? <laughs> my clone just appeared somewhere. Did you see him? <laughs> my clone. So here we are, your uh, your two debate family together. Uh, Sebastian, Lydia, and Dirk. What? Wait, uh, isn't there supposed to be a Sebastian versus Dirk debate in between? Yes, there is. But Dirk was lazy and on vacation and didn't uh, didn't bother debating. And uh, Sebastian didn't bother suggesting topics. And so we call that a debate that counts for Dirk automatically and moves straight on to another three three debaters episode. Is that right? Hi, Lydia. Hi, Sebastian. How are you doing? Great, thanks. I totally agree with your way of uh, of winning debates <laughs> against Sebastian when the by 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 fault. <laughs> I'm still alive, <laughs> and I will still debate, and I will still win. Okay, okay. So we never really established how winning in our three three debating round mode actually would look like. Like basically, we all argue, and in the end, it counts for Lydia. Or uh, how is that supposed to work? Winning, I mean. Yeah, that's good. That sounds good. <laughs> I suggest that we consider the person who wins is the one who lives closest to the UN headquarters in Europe. Oh, <laughs> smart move, smart move. <laughs> Yeah, or uh, next thing you suggest is the uh, the person that just won Swiss citizenship is uh, the winner by default, right? Yeah, and and, I, and it doesn't really matter how you won that citizenship if you found this at the supermarket or whatever, right? I guess you debated. You debated. You went to. <laughs> you went to whatever office it is you go to for a Swiss citizenship and had a proper debate with someone who couldn't run away. No, I, I don't know if I had mentioned this to you um, or if we mentioned it on a prior episode, but I did do a magic trick. That's 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 the truth. Right. At the end of my interview at the city hall, um, I had put on my CV that I'm an amateur magician and I did come with my cards prepared and I showed it to them at the beginning and I said, oh, maybe we can do this at the end. And they wanted and they insisted at the end. Thankfully, it worked. Imagine the fiasco. Because I, <laughs> here's the thing with you, Derek, it kind of worked. With everyone I've done it, it kind of worked. But I did it twice, twice in front of my team uh, last year or two years ago, and I failed. And I can tell you, when you're doing this in front of 30 people, in front of your team, you look a little bit ridiculous. So for the for the Swiss citizenship uh, magic trick, you you practiced a, a alternative program like singing and dancing in case the magic trick doesn't work. Or <laughs> what what what, did, what was I, your fallback? I didn't have a fallback option, but I do have a fallback option now because I've been practicing my little ukulele for ah, the past three months. Yes, I mm -hmm. remember. Yes, now I keep practicing. Yeah, do you have another song for us? I have another I have a French song and an American song, but I'm I my singing is really terrible. Cause it's nice to my because he, here's the thing, right? As most people may realize that you hear yourself through your throat, but you hear others through your ears. So when you hear your own voice through your throat, it actually throat sounds kind voice. of okay, right? You actually don't find your voice too horrible. And when you hear the recording of it, you're like, who's that? So um, maybe another time. But there's one that uh, there's a French song which I which I just like. I find it funny. Uh, it's actually not funny, but I find it funny. What I've done is upload the very first song I've learned from from start to finish, which was "Over the Rainbow," right? The classic on the ukulele. And funnily enough, even without the, without the lyrics, YouTube detects this as copyright material. It's the melody, right? The song is recognized, so it probably means I played it well enough that YouTube recognizes it, even without singing on top of it. Now the French song. It's funny because when I uploaded it, including with with and without the lyrics and the singing, it said, you know, it will take two minutes to detect if there's a copyright infringement. And then after the two minutes, it says, oh, further investigation required. And now wait another day. And then it says, oh, no copyright infringement. So I don't know if this means it did not detect it or if my singing is really horrible. Um, 
I, I, I want to think that it did not, it's just because it's a different tune. It's a slightly different key in which I'm singing and in which I'm playing than the original song. It probably did not detect, but um, I don't know how to take it. I'd rather, the, I'd rather have YouTube recognize what I'm doing, actually, even if I can't make money out of it, because obviously I need money. <laughs> All we right. So, Lydia, what the heck were you up to? It's been a while. I've started a new job. I've uh, moved three times. No, twice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what else? <laughs> Talking about overachieving. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's about it, I think. Well, that's pretty, pretty good. Pretty, uh, yeah, pretty good already. And how's your work so far? Because you're working as an architect, just to remind yeah, our listeners. Yeah, I'm starting, uh, I found two, two associates. So if all goes well, we'll be the third associate to the, to the company. And yeah, so far, there's stuff to, <laughs> there's stuff to do. You know, usually the yeah. sentence is "so far so good," right? I like it. Starts, so far, um, um, it's, it's interesting. Let's say so far their their methods are interesting. Not sure they're very efficient, but they're interesting. But at least what you told um, me off the record is that they're good people, nice people, right? They yeah. may not be the most efficient, but at least they are people you can work with. Yeah, which is not yeah, always yeah. a given. And who listen and who who want to who listen to contributions, who are open to discussion, who want to do stuff correctly, if, even if they don't have any methods right now. So, I'm what trying to, to keep, do? As you can see, I'm trying <laughs> to make sure you keep your job, Lydia. <laughs> it's not a stress. I mean, if if I don't stay there, I'm I'm just going to fall back on my previous plan, which was to to build my own company. So. It's not it's not a big deal if if it doesn't work out. What about you, Dirk? You were uh you you are off on a few days off at the moment. Yeah. And I totally wasted my time. Well, waste is maybe a big word, but I explored Greece virtually. Um in <laughs> in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. <laughs> yeah, I was I was playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I'm I'm well into into the ancient Greece world right now. Um, I'm a level 62 warrior, a demigod, actually. <laughs> <laughs> By now, wow. I successfully killed two Cyclopses and Medusa Ooh. and uh, somebody else I forgot. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I do when I'm not reading or podcasting. That is. So, um, are you yeah. playing with your with one or or your kids? One of your kids? Or no, that, this is your... it's actually a game that you play alone. So you you basically yeah. run around, um, but it's if you're not familiar with Assassin's Creed, uh, you're basically controlling an assassin, a paid killer that is. And every part of that Assassin's Creed series, I think they have like nine or ten by now, plays in a different time. Uh, so they had an, an, a, there is a game where you play a character in ancient Egypt. There is a, a game where you play in in Paris of the I think eighteen hundreds or something like that. There is uh, there there is uh, a, a part that plays in the in the Caribbean and you're a pirate and and this particular one I'm playing right now is in ancient Greece. And so in the beginning I play and they they have a reputation of paying a certain degree of attention to historical details. Details. So when you you find on YouTube videos of archaeologists basically commenting on what they see in the game, and they are they are actually commenting very nicely. It's like oh, oh yeah, that's authentic. Um, or here the statue, actually the statue is standing on the wrong place, but it's the right statue for the time, or stuff like that. They say they think like that. It's a very it's a very realistic uh, world and a huge world. So you can spend like uh, weeks in there exploring the surroundings and walking around. And yeah, that's what I, I've i done most of the time when I was not reading or podcasting. Because, you know, lockdown, cannot really walk out, uh, um, get out of the house anymore. So I'm spending my time indoors. Occasionally, when I run into an opponent that is too strong for my taste, because I'm, I'm the kind of person that gets... Uh, I'm getting impatient very quickly. So I'm I'm trying twice, three times, but if I 
if I spend an hour or two on on a, on some some opponent, that starts annoying me, and that kind of kills the fun. And that's usually the moment when I when I basically uh, pull in one of my teenage sons into my <laughs> into my chamber here and say like, "See that guy on the screen? Kill him." <laughs> and then, then, then they sit down and put their teenage reflexes to good use. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah other than that um it's it's a it's a fun fun diversion and i never i can't remember to have played a computer game for that such a long stretch in, in like uh you know, since i've been 16 so it's like uh really you mean you mean playing every single version of it for the past nine ten years is what you mean no um i never i never really paid several uh, i never really played for several days in a row like uh, you know, I'm I'm not I'm a, most of the time I actually do other things with my time than computer gaming, and right now I'm in a, a bit in a in a gaming uh, uh, spree, and I'm doing it every day and have fun with it. I'm just wondering if it's because your teenage kid is helping you out with uh, Assassin's Creed. Is that the motivation for your topic, your debating topic, as a as a way to repay him? <laughs> <laughs> What a nice transition! We're just getting wow. the hang of it. Wow! Help. Yeah, <laughs> excellent, excellent. I think uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe. Um, Do you want to tell us your topic? Yes, my debating topic was uh, um, teenagers should be allowed to vote, and I picked the word teenagers because that usually refers to uh, the kind of people that have uh, when you when you say their name, teen in the name, like starting with 13 so i'm not talking about 11 12 when they are really minors i'm talking about um the kids where where you find uh sometimes surprisingly grown up uh grown-ups uh in in the crowd um the kind of people that go on fridays for futures demonstrations and things like that right we having in in most european countries you have that um that uh that legal age of being allowed to vote uh, set to 18 in some countries there is uh there are local uh, elections that you can actually participate in with 16 but i would go further than that i don't see really a reason to not engage the youth in political debate and allow them to have their voices heard and i i do think especially in aging societies like in in germany it's not necessarily always a good thing that it's all only the the old people going to vote. I think there there is a need for balance, and that that is my thinking, not the gaming. It was basically that. So my debating um, motion was: uh, teenagers should be allowed to vote. Okay, let's do this. All right, Lydia, do you want to talk about one side? I think every country is unclear about where they stand on teenage participation in uh, in society. Uh, for example, in France, uh, teenagers can work and have a salary, have a salary, have a wage uh, from 16, but they can't vote until uh, 18. And so, if they can work, if they can be uh, economically independent, if they can even be independent from their parents, because you can ask for emancipation from 16 onwards. Then maybe maybe you can vote as well from from 16 onwards, uh, but at the same time you can't drive, you you can't you can't rent a, an apartment, stuff like that without your parents giving permit permission uh, if you're not emancipated. That is, unless you're you're 18, and in some countries it's even 21 to be able to to to, to buy alcohol stuff like that. So I think there's th th these varying ages. Uh, for varying degrees of, of independence, they don't really make sense to me. Uh, I think we should decide uh, when, wh at what age do we consider that uh, a teenager is uh, in full possession of his of his convictions? I guess at one mo at what moment he can actually make decisions for himself, and and that should be the age where the teenager can vote. If a teenager can decide to be emancipated and to work. If a teenager can decide to have sex also with somebody who's uh, over 18, from I think it's uh, the, the, in France, I think it's 15, la majorité sexuelle, the, 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 ad, the, the sexual adulthood uh, is at 15. So, I mean, these things are really important. And I don't think voting is more or less important than these, these things. So I would be mostly in favor of aligning all these thresholds 
maybe not 13. I don't know if 13 is the right age. Uh, I mean, we can debate on the actual figure, but having teenagers vote, I think, would be would be interesting. Also, for the reasons that you, that you said, to to rebalance a bit uh, our aging societies and have more more youth, more next generation voters. And last last point, maybe in favor of that is that if teenagers aren't interested in politics, politics, they won't vote. So what's what's the big deal? I mean, only the people interested will will actually go out and vote. Otherwise, they'll tell their parents they're going to vote and they'll just go and party with their friends. So, you know, so, I mean, it's not a problem for those who actually don't care. They won't vote, but that's the same for adults. So, yeah, I would be rather in favor of that motion. I I wonder if we're going to agree. So I'm probably going to have to take the devil's advocate. I did prepare both sides. And I'll start by saying, yes, I agree there is lack of clarity in terms of responsibilities that are given by society, whether it's age of sexual consent or when people can work or teens can work. Uh, But maybe the strongest argument I would have um, against getting teenagers the right to vote is to give them enough space and time to breathe and understand the dynamics but that should apply to everything else, uh, likewise, and maybe that also should go to work. And I don't, I don't know what to do about this. I just feel conflicted because I don't want to restrict anyone. It can be useful for teenagers who don't fit within the mold of the education system to actually start some kind of work when you're 16. But I see all these contradictions. So I don't know. I'll stop at this by saying that there is time necessary and understanding necessary before you can actually make a valid vote uh, matter. Uh, But I don't have anything stronger than this. So maybe we can spend some time in finding arguments that can go against the motion. Dirk, do you have anything? Yeah, so so let me let me put one layer on top of allowing teenagers to vote and then try to play devil's advocate myself because it's pretty clear that I'm actually in favor of of uh, teenagers voting and I I can make it a little bit more radical for your taste by saying, "Hey, if you're too young to vote yourself, why not allowing the parents to vote as a proxy for you?" Um, the, the the main reason is, and then, then we can actually drop the age. How about everybody gets as many votes as they are members of the family? And if they are minors, the, the legal representative is voting for them. And as soon as they are old enough, whatever old enough means, can be even, you could even tie that to some form of exam or whatever, right? Um, we allow we allow children to be participants in, in traffic. And very early on, they can ride a bike in traffic. They, um, from 12, on we they are at least partially in some countries partially responsible for their action from 14 on uh in most countries they can they can actually decide their own religious uh, faith there are religions out there that uh, consider you almost a grown-up with 14 so i would say everybody should be allowed to to vote full stop if you're a citizen of a country or if you are in a system of your country uh um you're you're a member of a society why not having a voice now um what would be arguments against that i would say the main argument uh against uh, allowing teenagers or minors to vote is the argument that they cannot be educated informed and formed uh, and and well-rounded enough to actually have a full-scale opinion on the complicated matters they're supposed to vote on right so it's basically an educational question it's a question of uh are they are they uh um, um mature enough to to overlook the consequences of the action and arguably children and kids and teenagers sometimes fail in that regard right they 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 take action um based on on impulse they they are uh filled with hormones that make them switch their opinions on a moment's notice and they may be easy to be influenced so that would be my devil's advocate kind of argument that uh, maybe they are not fully trustworthy yet as a, a adult may be and that i think is the main reason why there are those lines so they basically they are tied to the the assumption that most members of society once they are older than 18 are mature enough to at least have when they have the interest um and, uh, as as lydia said if you're not interested you're not voting anyway but if they have the interest then uh, they are the ma- majority of them are with 18 
capable of actually understanding the the complex topics. Um, I I guess that is the main reason why it's where it is. But I would drop it altogether. Now I've seen Lydia actually has raised her hand to to jump in. I mean, ev yeah, everything that I hear you say about um, leaving space for teenagers to understand the dynamics and um, giving them time to to get take take all this in getting mature enough uh, for understanding the consequences of their actions not reacting to impulse and everything are we talking only about teenagers um, I feel like most people react uh, from emotion from an em emotional uh, stance and and most people don't don't know all the I mean, I, I, I know I don't feel like I understand everything that's going on in politics. And it's been years that I've been reading on these topics and trying to trying to dig into it and understand what's behind the scenes. And I still don't feel like I, I, I'm getting to grips with what's happening. So, I mean, this is true for teenagers, but it's true more or less for any adult as well. So does that mean that we should stop voting? prevent anybody from voting or have an exam like Sebastian suggested, but then, or I think, or was it, was it you, Dirk? I, I can't remember. Suggested having an exam for saying at what moment um, uh, are you mature enough to vote? But then who decides what's in the exam and, and who decides who, who gets to vote? I feel like kids and teenagers often have the, the actual um, true questions that they might not be completely um, educated. Uh, they haven't finished uh, learning everything, but uh, we never do. And also, education is a form of uh, formatting. And so maybe maybe it's a good thing that kids actually yeah put those questions on the table. But then I'm not being devil's advocate. Again, <laughs> I'm playing the, I have a devil, playing for the motion. I have a devil's advocate thing that just came to my mind. Because while you were talking, I was thinking, if we put the youth on the map um, of politicians, that would mean they need to actually explain topics to them in a language they would understand, right? And I, as a parent, the experience I had was teenagers start actually digging in surprisingly deep as soon as they get the chance to and are intra, um, um, made aware of things and have the feeling that they can actually engage and change things. So once they, the interest is sparked, they're actually digging sometimes deeper into topics than any adult would. However, the devil's advocate argument here is um, teenagers and kids in general are arguably easier to to manipulate than than mature people. And if you if you give uh, political and political parties and politicians a price, like hey, you can convince voters to vote for you, they will do anything to basically convince their young voters to vote for them, right? So it's actually even putting putting up uh, a question mark on can you protect um, children from from politicians that basically try to to brainwash you as early as possible to vote for them, right? That would be maybe a devil's advocate uh, kind of stance as well. Now Sebastian had raised her hand and we are running out of to time go, anyway. to go further but it actually is quickly open to criticism what i'm going to say but it, it actually goes further into what you're saying by saying teenagers are arguably easier to manipulate uh you could connect this to the fact that the brain is not completely formed by a certain age the problem is and this is where it falls is that it's different from every single individual now you could say by 18 or 19 or 25 Every brain is completely formed. But then you could argue and say, hang on, some people have a more complete brain structure. And you could say some people are disabled, partially, not you know, mentally sick, but everyone, there's, there's no, no such thing as a perfect brain. So this falls very quickly, right? You, you, could, you could find some logic, a biological reason behind this aspect of it's easier to be not manipulated, but back to Lydia's, Lydia's point, you know, who is not biased? at every age, every time in their life, for whatever reason, by the way, for good and bad reasons. So I guess we're struggling to come with with reasons to not do this. And I actually like your proposal, Derek, when you say, actually it could be left to the parent to decide uh, if the child is emancipated uh, to be able to vote on their own from here onwards. Otherwise, they will vote by proxy on their behalf until they're 
whatever, 16 or 18. I actually like that proposal. Lydia, final words. These, these were my final words because we have to actually, wrap up. I don't like that proposal because <laughs> I don't. I feel like uh, give, giving teenagers the, the right to vote is giving them a voice, not giving their parents a, sec, a second or a third or a fourth vo voice. Um, I mean, when we gave uh, the, the right to vote to women, uh, of course, many men thought, okay, if I'm married, I'm going to have a second vote, uh, whereas single men are going to have only one vote. But but that's not that's not the thing. I mean, women wanted to vote for themselves, oh. and I think this is um, this is uh, somehow uh, the same kind of debate. If we're saying teenagers can vote when and saying in the same sentence, uh, but if parents feel like they can't, then then parents can take away that right once again. It's um, it's a bit like what happened in, at the beginning with with women so, with women being treated like like children. So. so so what I was saying so just to make that that clear what I was that's why I said teenagers should be allowed to vote because I was basically putting up the motion that hey from 13 on you're allowed to vote full stop. But then I added a layer and said like why not just saying everybody has a vote. And when you're younger than 13 or when you maybe put, you can put it in multiple ways, right? right? You can say your parent vouches for you that you're mature enough to have your own vote, even if you're 10, say. Or you're younger than 13 and from 13 on it would be legal. But if you're younger, then the vote basically is exercised by your parent, which is, by the way, the way it's it's handled in most cases right now as well. If you're a minor, then your parent is deciding for you a, a lot of things assuming that the parent's job is to ha to act in your best interest as a child. If you as a parent fail on acting in their best interest, actually the state is bound to step in at some point and there are processes for that. But if, assuming that you're acting in the child's best interest, that would uh, would mean if, you're, if the child is not uh, ready yet to act themselves, then you as a parent have, have a duty to explain to them the concept in a language they understand, ask their opinions, put them in and maybe act uh, or execute that vote for them. That was basically the thinking. But uh, that's because I anticipated this as being a bit of a, a actually a more complex debate. Um, I, I said teenagers should be allowed to vote to make it easier on us. Mm -hmm. The, the the argument that uh, you made earlier on, Sebastian, about uh, protecting, uh, protect, l l giving time for teenagers, and that you uh, you built on Dirk by saying, okay, we can also try to protect them from politicians. Uh, I mean, that's that's the argument against the motion that that gives me pause, and that make me, makes me think that yeah, maybe. There's already a lot going on that's robbing kids from their their young years and giving them so much to think about. Maybe giving giving them um, the right to vote is is something very uh, very dramatic for a let's, time of life switch. where you want. Let's to just switch have to your topic, and I'll make actually a, a hopefully a, uh, an interesting transition here because if I'm cynical. We did not talk about this. Maybe the reason why the vote has the the age for voting has not been decreased yet is probably because the people in power realize that these votes will probably be not good towards them. As you can see in most countries, the older you get, the more conservative you are. This has been demonstrated over and over again in all Western societies. And obviously the politicians, for most of them, are older people, closer to you know retirement age or even beyond retirement age. So they probably don't have an interest in having more young people voting because these young people would vote not vote for them because they don't represent the interest of the youth uh, for the most part. So that's a bit of the cynical standpoint as to maybe why this has not happened yet. Let's move to the next motion because I think it's a good transition to your motion, Lydia, even though it's not exactly the same area, but it's talking about politics. What is your motion? My my motion is that politicians should be replaced by technicians, or not. So, well, can you explain maybe what technicians are, or, or do you mean bureaucrats? Do you mean experts? Uh, I, I would go with experts. So, 
um, what we call, yeah, often technocrats, that kind of that kind of vocabulary. The idea be behind this motion is that more and more um, our political leaders are trying to justify their, their measures by a kind of mathematical demonstration of this is the right thing to do because this and this and that, and this expert says this, and, and this is the theory about economics or whatever. And so if I, have, if I do this action, then everything will be better. But of course, politicians themselves are not experts. So should we actually go one step further and uh, replace politicians by these experts and these technicians? My brain goes to be in favor of the motion. I want to have experts running the state. But my heart and a small fraction of my brain go towards against the motion. So I'm going to go against the motion. And I have um, two arguments. Two arguments to go against the motion. That's what I will go. Uh, the first one is if we start restricting who can be elected, i.e. if you have to have a specialty, an expertise, then obviously this is no longer a democracy. It's not uh, – any citizen cannot be elected anymore, and that's a big drawback. And uh, it's another system. We can have that system, but it's not the way we've been trying to convince people that they have a say in politics. I think it will go the other way, which will make it even – uh, problematic in terms of this disconnect between the elites, as they're called, and the random citizen who's voting. So that's my strongest argument. The second strong argument I have for this is, after all, after all, the administration, the running of the state every day is not made up of elected people. They're not elected people. They are the real experts. They're running the state. And just like in a company, C-level executives, CEOs, CMOs, they don't have all the skills required. They're organizing this entire company, the entire administration, to go towards a vision. But at the end of the day, um, the, the little hands, the people doing and uh, organizing the state are the non-elected uh, people, the experts. And the politicians, I would assume, as I have, I think, observed over the years, do call on these experts. They, otherwise, they would not be able to run anything. So I think it's actually a good system to have someone selling a vision to you because it is a salesman's job and you're buying into that vision. Do I want to be part of the EU? Do I not want to be part of the EU? Do I want to have the euro? Do I want to be friends with Russia? Do I want to be friends with the US? Do I want to be friends with nobody? I think that's the kind of direction we need to have. And the politician is pretty good at that, to be honest, in terms of communicating and selling. They're probably shit in terms of expertise, but I don't think this is what is required of them. So in short, it's not a democracy if you start restricting who can be elected. And the administration, the government is not run by this, these people. They're run by experts already. Cool. So my role is now to defend technocracy, meaning the leadership by people who are subject matter experts. Um, we live in a complicated world. If the last couple of years and actually the entire history um, of our governmental system teach us one thing, then that a power alone is a, a bad way to really make rational decisions that inf uh, impact um, thousands, if not millions of people. Right now, COVID is a very good example. You and I, Sebastian, we debated whether or not humankind is capable of dealing with a global pandemic. And you were the one actually saying, no, no way, it's not capable. And right now we see what happens when when not the technical experts, but uh, politicians make uh, call the shots. So all of a sudden, people are driven uh, in their decision making by who who is likely to vote for them next term. That's uh, first off, it's a short term perspective. Second. Secondly, it's not a data-driven perspective or not a facts-driven perspective. It's a power-driven perspective. And there are, there are um, moments when actually the power-driven perspective is not uh, benefiting the, the majority of the people, uh, may turn to worse, and where uh, complex matters are oversimplified because you want to wanna articulate your vision to a, to a average educated uh, citizenship. So I would say um, having a, a system of governmental responsibilities that's, that's sitting on the shoulders of experts, of technicians, of people who make a living and uh, spend their days analyzing and understanding information and making uh, clearly uh, um, uh, clear judgments based on, on those uh, findings 
would lead to a better outcome in many of the critical situations we face right now in the long term. That all goes to say um, that that depends on on people enjoying being kind of exposed to a dictatorship because that's in the end what it is. You basically it's a dictatorship of the wise and knowing instead of, as you said, uh, um, Sebastian, instead of having a democracy where the demos is actually ruling. Um, it's it's not about who who wins the most uh, support. It's about who has the facts on their side. Uh, and it's also assuming that you you have a clear situation where facts clearly are for you. So it que- the question is, is there an escaping? And that may be the question we put to Lydia. Is it even possible? Because uh, I can imagine, right, right now, COVID is also, again, a good example. I can imagine plenty of scenarios where you have the economical expert having very good arguments for opening things up, where the virologist has very good arguments for closing things down. And if you put all of those people, all of those groups and potential experts in the room, the device they are left to work with in the end is regular politics because they have to make up their mind based on a social process instead of actually just dealing with facts. What is the side you would lean to and what is your thinking behind that motion? My my leaning is to a definite no. I believe that there is no technician that is not politicized. I don't know if that's the right English word. There's no, there's no science of the real world, be it economics, uh, um, sociology, uh, even biology to some extent, at least in the dealing of public health. That isn't a matter of where you stand, wh- with what underlying bias, underlying convictions are you looking at reality? Where do you stand first and then how do you look? And that is in... in that is actually politics. I mean, that is a political stance. I think there is no fact in real life. There is how you look at facts, just as there is no fact in journalism and there is only a way to present facts. The same the same event, you can make it go any 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 which way, depending on how you present it. What what do you choose to look at? Uh, and what criteria do you cho- choose to to use to decide if this is a good or a bad solution? And choosing the criteria, defining the, this uh, filter through which you're looking at reality, that is politics for me. That is a political conviction. And so there is no expert that is not uh, that does not uh, speak from a political point of view. And I think just like in journalism, it's it's uh, it's uh, an error to think that uh, it's a mistake to think that that people are experts and are completely unbiased. So that would be my my first uh, conviction. But then when I heard you speak, Dirk, there's something that made me wonder if maybe, um, of course, we need all these experts to be uh, to to agree, and they probably would would not have the same. Uh, the same idea on what are the good measures to to enforce on in a specific situation, but actually that would be a good thing because forcing all the experts, but not only the the mainstream ones, forcing all the experts to find a consensus, just like we've seen it sometimes in in um, citizen committees, uh, people from any any social class, any uh, any age, any gender, being forced to find a consensus with all the others on a certain topic. This brings really good ideas uh, and efficient ideas forth. forth. There's a there's a, um, intelligence intelligence of the masses uh, when people come together and are forced to, to decide something together. But actually, that's not specific to experts. So I I I stand on my on my conviction that I don't think that technicians should be should replace politicians because technicians are politicized, uh, and it would be a mistake to think otherwise. The thought that I have around this is it's a it's a common common uh, notion though um, in politics. Um, you know, Trump came to power on the grounds of saying, "Oh, I'm an experienced CEO, and I'm going to run this country like uh, like a company," which is. Which is fairly stupid, actually, because it misses a point that countries actually are not like companies, but uh, uh, doesn't matter. The, the idea is similar to 
to the 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 question should we have should we hand over the power to to technical experts um it's a very similar notion to say let's take the power from the politician to the to the economical expert to the business manager right and um i think though this perspective discounts one key fact uh, politicians are experts too politicians are experts in manufacturing consent um, are experts in finding the, the the possible middle ground. Politicians are experts in preparing a very complex governmental system in a democracy to a place where uh, to the point that there are decisions being made. And yes, the currency these decisions are being brokered with or the conversations are driven with is public consent and power. But in the end, Politicians do something that's really hard to learn. I doubt that anybody who is just thrown into that position can do that job really well. It's not a it's not an easy job. It's a it's an expertise to be able to manage the the kind of crowd voice and crowd knowledge. And uh, we found sometimes better, sometimes not so good solutions around this. But I do think this is this is one of the core misconceptions that people kind of look at politicians with that uh, perspective of, oh, those are just the ugly, power-hungry uh, idiots who don't know th uh, things. I do think in mature democracies, the governments actually have groups of experts on their payroll. They they try to bring in those experts' voices. They just don't have them calling the shots. They use that as input for to build the narrative, to have the conversation, to, to prepare the uh, discussions and all that. Sebastian. Yes, we need to wrap up. And I'll say one thing in favor of experts replacing politicians. And my strongest argument would be as follows. Um, or rather, it will stem from an observation. Why is it? Why is it that every time a country is in crisis, for instance, a government is unable to take a decision, COVID, economic crisis, every single time, you can look at Greece, you can look at Italy, you can look at Romania, Every time technocrats were called in, people who had actually very little political experience, but a very strong, deep expertise in a particular field. And that begs the question as to why is it happening only when there is an, a country in crisis? It seems that they're better suited to find a resolution or a solution. The, the additional point connected to this is I have a hunch that having experts who are maybe biased, probably biased, but less political in the sense that what we see every day um, would make things less polarized and probably less corrupt. Now, it's a hunch. It would, it would need to be verified, but I have a hunch that this would be the case. It doesn't, it doesn't change my stance uh, as to what I exposed uh, earlier, but this is what I, I think is an interesting or curious observation to make people doubt. We need to move on to the next topic, if that's okay with you. My motion is as follows. Nothing can, I'm not too sure, nothing can or nothing will be done to prevent China from taking control of Taiwan. Now, the context, just for our listeners and maybe for both of you, is that repeatedly and as late as I believe last week or a couple of weeks ago, there were Chinese fighter jets flying over Taiwan's uh, airspace. To do what? We don't exactly know. But it's not the first time, it probably won't be the last time that continental China is threatening to take control of Taiwan. I think nothing will be done. Because All right, nothing, nothing has will be done. Really... What, are, what is your main argument or your main arguments? I feel like nothing has been done in the last decades, really, to, to, to stop this situation, to defend... Uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's independence or claim to independence. Um, the, the the ambiguity is convenient for everybody. So, I mean, I just I I believe that nothing will be done because I I don't see how the situation today is different from the situation a few years back or. 10 years back or 20 years back and I've been seeing the same articles uh, dated 2001 
so 20 years back and the same the same um, uh, anxiousness about what was going to happen and how China might use force and and yeah okay we have articles in the newspapers but basically it stops at that so I'm just speaking from a historic perspective I think things are just going to stay as is I don't see how any condition has changed sufficiently significantly for the reactions of the, the international community to, to, to be significantly different. That's it. <laughs> Lydia makes very compelling arguments. So the facts, uh, fact of the matter is uh, right now it's uh, Taiwan is, on the surface is only very weakly defended. Right, so it's like uh, we we basically give in to every demand China made in the past. Like uh, the the policy China follows by um, by answering every every inch that's b given towards uh, Taiwan being an independent state and recognition with a total boycott sometimes of international bodies of pulling out money and um, being openly outraged uh, led to a place where we keep everything in that vague imbalance where we basically recognize Taiwan without recognizing it. Um, the question, however, is why do we think China hasn't taken Taiwan back like decades ago? The the discussion about Taiwan being an uh, basically a part of China is is uh, is really really old. China sees Taiwan as a as part of of their their uh, land mass, and despite that being a policy in China, they they stayed away from they shied away from actually open conflict around this. They allowed Taiwan to become a democratic state basically um, so far. And the reason why that is is because uh, they fear economic sanctions. They fear the downfall of the relationships um, in with with the global community into which they are networked just as much as we are networked into into their communities. So I do believe the status quo is going to remain for, for quite a while longer, simply because all participants, including China, have more to lose than to win. Right now, Taiwan is relatively powerless. It's painted into a corner. Nobody is really making a move forward or backward. And China can keep rattling the, the sabers, but uh, will will basically keep it where it is right now. That's what I believe. However... Should they at some point, because somebody else comes to power, they just they just decide that now is a time, start making a move. I'm with Lydia that I see very little actually stopping them from doing doing that. But that was the case like two or three decades ago as well. They have more to lose, if anything, right now because uh, they want to be a raising power. They want to have more influence. They want to have more money. So actually, it's getting even harder for them to to make that move. What's your uh, real opinion? Because you were forced to to adopt that stance that something would be done, and or at least at least China would not uh, do this because it would it would be detrimental. But it, it, what is your real opinion? My real opinion is that uh, we are playing with fire, and we I mean the Western world right now with China. So uh, just because Biden is in power didn't change anything how how the U.S. behaves towards China, and China is the bad guy for Europe as well, and. This drives an agenda of uh, separation that becomes really dangerous because my whole argument rests on the fact that there is a very, really, really tight economical network between China and the rest of the world. And the more we have basically a separation of these, the more we open the door for any kind of conflict. And if at some point the, the scale tips and China just hasn't as much to lose anymore because they are first off, have enough money on the bank. And secondly, um, the Western world kind of pulled out all the things they, they th that kept them engaging with us, no matter uh, what the, the policy internally was. If if this t this scale tips, then they really have no reason to, uh, to, to hold back. Then they just m walk into Taiwan and there's nothing on this planet that's going to stop them from, from that. We are not going to start a world war over Taiwan. That's just not going to happen. So um, that, is, that is my real opinion. I think we are on a slippery slope and uh, chances are that this is what's going to happen in, in, let's say, 20, 30 years from now. I agree with you. Uh, in fact, we already have a precedent with Russia and Crimea. Nothing happened, right? Russia just steps in officially, unofficially, and no one re really re reacts. 
In the case of Taiwan, uh, the additional problem, which Ukraine did not have, so Ukraine was in a better position, and despite being in a better position, was subject to Russia's uh, army or mercenaries. And in the case of Taiwan, fewer and fewer countries are actually officially recognizing Taiwan as a country. Uh, you may not have noticed, but a lot of the Pacific islands have closed their ties or embassies uh, in Taiwan as a result of Chinese investment money. Uh, and that's the condition. Uh, and that's a major problem when you have countries which don't recognize another state officially. And finally, I think your point you know, it's, it's true. I don't see other superpowers, especially not Russia, uh, engaging in a formal war against China. And I think the counter argument to your point when you try to do, to against the motion by saying, why has China not taken Taiwan already? Well, I would I would contend that at least 30, 30 or 40 years ago, they probably did not have the military power that they have today. Uh, with the millions of uh, green men that they probably have today and the, I don't know, the cyber warfare material that they probably also possess, uh, I would probably bet that the uh, military power of China is much stronger today relative to Taiwan and the US than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I do think it's unlikely, but not impossible, to have this localized conflict, which unfortunately, according to the three of us, is bound to happen. It could become a major global war. Uh, I don't think it's completely impossible. Uh, it could be fought by proxy, uh, i.e. not officially the US or Europe engaging, but having other, I don't know how it could happen, but other countries in the area Wasn't any final like, thoughts Dave? like his, historically um isn't isn't jap uh, japan also um a nation that uh could make a claim for taiwan right um so uh, when you say war by proxy the question is who would be players in in that conflict and uh there are several and nations who would have an interest also yeah. because i mean nations don't go in a war if they don't have an interest and yeah, if Japan you, has one, but what what would be no? The it, it would not be about interest. seizing Taiwan. It's about the the landscape of the area. The Philippines, Vietnam, have also are also claiming rights on um, sea territories, maritime territories, and there are fake islands which have been created by China over the past years with military bases on them and um, airline uh, airport strips. So they can land their fighter jets and they say, well, this is a Chinese island and we get the, uh, the what do you call the international waters? I extend beyond whatever, 12 miles, 200 miles around because this island. Land. So yeah. actually a lot of okay. uh, uh, countries in the US historically has always funded uh, the Philippines and uh, Vietnam to actually try and go against the Chinese influence. So it's not necessarily about Taiwan only. The thing is, if China actually invades Taiwan, which we all seem to think it's likely to happen in the next decades, it actually goes beyond that. China will want to have more access to the South China Sea and so on and so forth. We have a few minutes left and it's time for trivia. I have six questions. Who wants to start? Three for each. Who wants to start with my okay, trivia questions? Go. I will. Okay, you start. Okay, let's see who can win the most points. You have three questions each. I'll take you. I'll give you ten by ten. It's purely trivia. Uh, there's no common theme. Sorry, I just try, try to come up with something a little bit original. Question: True or false? The color orange is named after the fruit. I'll go with. Mm, false. You're overthinking. Because, it's, yeah, I because would, what? I don't know because where are oranges from? I mean, how, <laughs> how are the where are oranges from, and how are they called in their in their original country? I mean, well, I'm not sure they're called orange. Oranges. The the actual answer is true. Oh, no! You're overthinking. Ah! You may have <laughs> the answer was too difficult. I'll let you look it up uh, on the fruit and the name of the color. Question to you, Dirk. True or false, on average, at least one person is killed by a drunk driver in the US every single hour. On average, at least one person is killed by a drunk driver in the United States every single hour. I go with false. true. You want to, you're certain about your answer? You want to revisit your answer? <laughs> uh, well, 
So I would say um, every single hour. That's not an outlandish number. I also I saw a statistic the other day that I put to my teenage son because he insists on driving the bike without a helmet on. And I put, looked it up and I, um, there are two bike accidents every day in Frankfurt alone. So extrapolating this kind of things to a country with like several hundreds of million of people, it, I just say true. Unfortunately, it is true. One point for you. Lydia, the sum of all the numbers on a roulette wheel, because you very uh, you go to the casino very often, on a roulette wheel, the sum of all the numbers is equal to 666. True or false? <laughs> uh, the number of the I beast. Want to, I want to think it's true. <laughs> I want to think it's true. What are the numbers? I have no freaking clue. <laughs> And they go up to 80-something, right? Don't try to do the maths. Yes or no? <laughs> True or okay. It, it might no take a while. What the, <laughs> what the numbers are on the roulette wheel. Um, okay, I'll go with two. Because it's and, funny. And the answer is true. <laughs> the total numbers <laughs> actually add up to... And I believe the numbers go to run from zero to, what, 30... Six, thirty-three, thirty-five. 35? I have no idea. 35, I seem to think, to see an image. All right, one point each. Derek, what is a dakimakura? A what? <laughs> a daki... What is a dakimakura? Uh... Is it in one word or two? It's one word, but um, it's, it's a Japanese word. I'll help you. Dakimakura. Um, that's an ancient fighting mask that puts a face on the back of your skull to confuse your uh, your opponent. I like the confidence in your answer. <laughs> and the answer is not at all. Dakimakura is a type of a large pillow, also called as a body pillow. So it's 160 centimeters high. And it was apparently a thing in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, so it's actually a thing. You can look it up. It's a bit, uh, it's Japanese. That's all I can say <laughs> because you have often uh, cartoon Japanese manga characters on the body pillow. So it's not far away from the sex dolls and that kind of stuff. But Dakimakura is actually uh, the, the term for it. In English, it's often translated as a body pillow. I had no idea either. All right, one point each. Lydia should be pool and buy Sebastian one of those pillows. He clearly wants one. <laughs> All right. I think All it right. was, uh, yeah. It's, uh, Last question. Listen carefully. Guys, Listen carefully. Back rub was the original name of the Google search engine. True or false? Back rub. Poker face. That can't be true. <laughs> that can't be true. No, seriously? The answer is it was called back rub. So you still. Oh, I'm not biased at all. If yes, you get this right, you, you have to answer the next question to win. <laughs> all right, Dirk? Yeah. I, I'm biased towards my sister. All right. A neck plant is a vegetable. True or false? I say false because you, it's a trick question and you. <laughs> And the answer is, it's a fruit. <laughs> Vegetables don't exist. <laughs> if you go by that, by by the, I mean, hey, what is a I vegetable? make the questions. Wait, wait, Lydia. But for Derek to win. He needs to answer the next question. It's the bonus I I, question. I, I answer hey, plenty of wait questions. Wait a second. Here. What's a vegetable if you're, if you're going, if you're saying that vegetables if, don't exist, you only have fruits or seeds or whatever. What's a vegetable? All right. You can look up what is a vegetable. Uh, Derek has a last question to see if he really wins. Okay. If he doesn't get it right, it's a tie. <sighs> <laughs> I won like three questions ago. Now you're making it up to make Lydia win. I am going to listen to this a second time. <laughs> All right. So. I give me give me the question, oh, oh, almighty rule maker. 
Now he's looking Nefelo, Nefelo Kokigia. Nefele, Nefelo <laughs> Kokigia. What, what is that? <laughs> it's a practice, it's in English. It's a practice of doing what? Nefelo Kokigia. But the fun thing is, Lydia gets yes, no questions, and I have to do things like that. <laughs> So exactly. then for all I care, that could be a, uh, like a sexual transmitted disease and I have no way you're of not, knowing. You're not, you're not far away. It's an activity. So. An activity. So the, I'm not far away. So we're talking about exercise. It's a very, very rare <laughs> type of exercise. I have no idea. Of course, Lydia it's, wins because you're making practice. the rules and she's no, your sister. The whole system it's is a, rigged. Do you want a happy answer? Ooh. I think that's a no. When I, when I say when I say when I say yes, do I win? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the practice of finding shapes in clouds, and I have no idea if it's a vegetable or a fruit either. But but no. But knowing that you have to run, Sebastian, let's wrap this up. It was a pleasure. It was fun. Thank you for preparing the question, Sebastian. And Lydia, next time, next time, we're going to prepare questions. Yeah, we said that last time already, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, the time before that. But it will happen eventually. And that's uh, that imagine Sebastian's pro surprise. <laughs> to our listeners. It and then, yeah. To our <laughs> listeners, stay tuned. We'll have more of these crazy episodes coming up. If you have any reaction, if you enjoyed this, email us, tell us what we should debate on. Or if you want to participate, likewise, don't hesitate to send us a note. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Dirk. Always a pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you. Take Have care. Nice Bye-bye. Bye. I haven't seen anybody in one year. <laughs> well, look. Look at the screen. We're here now. Wow, Me neither. So there, are days, there are days where I feel like the whole world is in a pandemic and we are forced to stay at home. Do you know that feeling? <laughs> <laughs>